was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas of Australia. Basically, what you did was tell them when you were available, and they'd send you to a remote farm for a few weeks, where you would do whatever they needed done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got in with a nice group of workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property. I was told it covered roughly the same landmass as the state of Maryland, USA, about nine hours from Sydney City, and the property itself was about 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was in the middle of nowhere. I was working at the farm clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the city. Our boss was a guy called Jeremy who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot and the work was hard. So one day when the temperature hit about 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew of a water hole on the farm about a 25 minute drive north. I was keen for a swim but the other guys just wanted to relax for the afternoon. So him and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker, so we drove more or less in silence. After about 20 minutes, however, he suddenly perked up and jabbed me in the ribs. Do you see that over there, beneath the two dead trees? I should not mention here that if you're not familiar with inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown or red and mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer we realized it was a huge blue shipping container just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed, and I asked him if he knew what it was, but he obviously didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove through the same area about five weeks before, and he wanted to go and see what it was. Initially, we pulled to a stop about 100 meters away from it. At this stage, I had a really bad feeling. The whole thing wasn't right. It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expanse, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate, which I understood, given it was his property, but in truth, I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side, all motion activated so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, with all this security, someone obviously doesn't want us here, let's just go. He brushed me off, however, reminded me it was his farm, and whoever had put this here was trespassing, so he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, there was only a small padlock on the huge door. He had bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see this was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place, and the sort of hum you hear when a hard drive is working hard. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated, albeit somewhat cluttered, office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high, and plastic storage boxes scattered around the far wall, and several desks with computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage, I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desk to see if the computers could give us any idea of what was going on here. My heart was racing and I just wanted to bolt. We had been seen by CCTV so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy on the other hand was adamant we had to get to the bottom of this so I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while but in short, neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. The best I can describe it from my lay position is that it was endless lists of computer talk. It was like how the old Napster or LimeWire download screens look like, just constantly picking up and receiving data, then recording it on several windows. 
I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over to the far end of the container to the big pile of storage boxes. By then I was pretty sure no one else was there, as there was nowhere to hide really, but I was still incredibly on edge. I decided, against my better judgment, to see what was inside all these boxes. My brief sift through this box still makes me feel sick to my stomach. It didn't take me long to realize that this box was full of posters, DVDs, and photos, all of explicit and hardcore child X-rated material. One thing that still gets to me is that it was all neatly ordered into folders and small boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string a sentence together. I said something to the effect of, Mate, get out. Dude, child, what? Just get, get out of here, dude. I dragged him out, composed myself and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile phone reception, we hadn't bought the satellite phone, so we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make it all the way to the farm from the nearest police station, which was in a town about a half hour from the town closest to the farm, as I mentioned, very remote. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen, until the cops arrived almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and led them back this is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container door was open and there was fire inside. We had only two small extinguishers in the cars and they did very little. The fire department took an hour to get there, which by that stage, most of the damage was already done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described and only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property, and the landmass was huge, and there was no real way to tail them. Since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first instance, probably due to our poor explanation of the phone, aerial surveillance was also impossible by that time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still there on the farm, as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. September 2010 my boyfriend Dave, his best friend Tony, and my best friend Liz and I were all coming back to our hometown for our final year of college after spending the summer in London. We had a fantastic time, staying in my uncle's apartment, partying, and exploring such a big city. It was great. We stopped at a bed and breakfast that night about half of the way home and were planning to get home at about 6pm. We all woke up early, about 4, maybe 5, ready to set off again we discovered that someone had obviously driven too close to our car and broke the right wing mirror off. Seeing as this was my dad's birthday present to me, and I had it barely two months, I was absolutely fuming. We asked the landlady where we could possibly find spares or something to use for the time being. She said she had driven past a makeshift scrapyard or something a while back. She wasn't sure if it was still there, but she drew us a rough map and we got back on the road. I wasn't very sure if she was right about her directions because the closer we got to the area she circled it in, the more desolate the surroundings were. The roads got more difficult and had gone from stone to dirt. Around us there weren't any farms anymore, just long weedy grass and patches of forest. It had basically become a moor. We were about to head off because of the wild animals, and I just had to get over being a paranoid driver and deal without my wing mirror. When surely enough, my boyfriend pointed out in front to a handwritten sign directing us two miles down the road to cafe and car spares. We drove down into a little cove surrounded by forests and all got out, except for my friend Liz who was asleep in the back seat. There was a tiny cream hut with cafe spray painted on the roof, a caravan, and a hill of metal and bits of cars. As to be expected, we were the only visitors parked up in front. The sun was up but no lights or people were around. I guess they were still sleeping. It was still about six anyway. We all walked up to the scrap pile and I had to fumble through it. 
looking for a wing mirror or any sort of mirror that could do for the time being until I could get it repaired. Tony picked up what could only be at least a decade old mirror and suggested we just take it and go. But me, being stupid and sincere, insisted I have to go give them some money for it. I can't just take it and go. I knocked on the door and waited. A big, hard-faced man answered the door and at first looked angry and tired, then smiled at me a two-toothed smile. He leered at me for a few seconds, then, seeing the boys approach, asked us what we wanted. Tony handed him the mirror and asked how much for it. He said nothing, just to get to know us, to which I thought fair enough. Two more men then left the patio door on the other side. They turned and smiled, both skinheads with teeth like meth addicts, and came over. They stank. He gave them the mirror and told them to go attach it to our car. He then introduced himself as Ian, sat us down on the patio chairs and offered us some sandwiches. I politely declined, but he insisted we must be hungry and told me to come in, that women are best at making sandwiches. I declined again, finding him a little bit sexist at this point, and when he asked again, Dave, more sternly, reinforced that I said I don't want to come in. Ian muttered something and then came and sat on the chairs with us. It became awkward very quickly as he started asking questions. It started off innocently, like asking us how old we were, where we were from, and then became a little more uncomfortable. He asked if I had a boyfriend, to which Dave answered, and then started asking us both what we liked to do to each other, private stuff like that to which we didn't answer. We sat in silence, until we heard Liz scream. When we turned around, I saw one of the men meant to be fixing the mirror with his hand in the back window grasping Liz's leg. The other was looking around nervously behind the car. We got up immediately and sprinted off the patio, Tony running after the guys, but they both headed into the forest. Liz was hysterical. She'd woken up to find herself on her own in the car and a man's hand running up her leg. I can't even imagine how terrifying that must have felt. I got into the back seat with her and consoled her while Dave came around the other side to get in and told us some nails were on the floor. We looked over and there were about 12 of them arranged around the tire like the guy was ready to pop them. I couldn't really think why at the time but now I wonder where they got all those car parts. We decided it was enough. We didn't want to spend any more time there, mirror or no mirror, and were ready to go when Tony was the last to get in the car. He closed the back seat door and as we looked back and saw Ian re-emerge from the house with something long in his hands, running towards us. My vision adjusted when he got a bit closer, and then I realized he was holding a rifle. A hunting rifle. At that point I actually burst into tears and hit the engine, slamming on the accelerator as hard as possible. The car started to go and we got up to about 90, forgetting the dirt roads and just driving over whatever until that scrapyard was out of sight. We didn't stop looking behind us until we were safely on the motorway getting home. To this day, whenever I go to London I take a train instead. I'm still terrified I'll meet them again. I live in a town of about 11,000 in rural Wisconsin. Not by reference, but for a job, we are moving when I get a better one. I was on my way to my employer's house. He runs the company out of his basement until we get a new office space. I was being tailgated bad by a ratty blue car and a white bald guy. I drive a Kia Soul, which has a flat back end. So if I can't see your headlights, that means you're a mere few inches off my butt, and you will get me tapping my brakes. This guy did. He honked at me. Whatever. I flipped him off and slowed down to five miles under the speed limit. There wasn't anyone behind me so I wasn't ruining anyone else's day. He had chances to pass me on the country road but didn't. After a few minutes with no other cars around and him still kissing my bumper at 50 miles per hour, I grabbed my cell phone and pretended to turn around quickly and take a picture of him. Then I pretended to call 911. I was in the country with no other cars around and this guy was getting creepy. I came to my turn but decided to see if this guy would follow me. I turned left and he followed. Then I came to a roundabout and thought I would lose him. I traveled the entire thing around twice and he still followed me. At this point I knew he was messing with me, trying to scare me. 
Well, I decided to let myself be late for my meeting. I began to drive to the police station. He followed me the whole way there. I pulled up and parked, ready to run inside. I thought he would leave. Nope. He parked right next to me and just stared at me, and he pulled up on my side of the car close enough that I would have a hard time opening the door all the way. He was in his forties, I'm guessing, wearing sunglasses and a creepy smile. He was wearing fairly neat clothes, nothing scary there. The interior of the car was pristine. I was anticipating to see a gun. I should mention here that I'm training to be a behavior analyst and while I work with kids right now, my hobby is criminal behavior and profiling. I was seriously trying to read this guy. A few seconds went by and I grabbed my phone again, this time intent on calling 911 from the police station parking lot. As I dialed, he rolled his passenger window down, said nothing, rolled it back up and took off. I went inside and told an officer what happened. Sadly, I was too focused on not crashing to get a plate number. Apparently, there had been a lot of complaints about tailgaters recently, multiple with a blue car. I filled out a report with the officer, and they gave me a card for victim services in a local woman's shelter, just in case he followed me home one night and I didn't feel safe, but I live in a secure building with my fiancé. I went out to my car, and there was a note on the windshield. All it had on it was a smiley face. Serious horror movie stuff there. I took it back inside. The officer said he'd call me a few times during the night and I should avoid going anywhere alone for a while. He did call twice and said he was patrolling my parking lot during his night shift. This is a small town and the attitude around here is very communal, so I feel safe that someone will back me up. If I ever see this guy again, no question, I will call 911 and lead him straight to the police station again. I also told my fiancé that I will post my work schedule or even when I have to leave for another reason, and that if I don't text him within 10 minutes of my estimated arrival, to call 911. This happened like 16 years ago. I was 12 then. I was in the summer camp of my Boy Scout troop, but with both boys and girls. As are all in Spain, scouting here is actually a quite liberal thing. One of the most important activities during the summer camp is what we called the raid, basically going out of the camp to adventurously trek for a couple of days. My friends and I planned an amazing route through a beautiful mountain range called the Pyrenees in the northeast of Spain. Three days walking, two nights sleeping out of the camp. My raid group consisted of 15 boys and girls, all between the ages of 12 and 14 years old. We took food with us, knew how to read a map, how to build shelter, how to search for water, and pretty much anything necessary to survive for a couple of days, so no adults were coming with us, and that doesn't happen anymore. Our plans for the first day were to climb a mountain that was just under 10,000 feet high and sleep by a glacial lake nearly on top of it. It was a long walk from our camp, about 15 miles and quite steep, so at about 1800 we decided we were going to not reach the lake at a prudent time. We found a nice place to build a shelter, did it, and then cooked some dinner. We were in the middle of a beautiful mountain, about six miles from the nearest road, and let's add another five kilometers more to the closest village. We couldn't have been happier. We still had nearly two hours until sunset when we finished our meal, so we thought it was a good idea to send a smaller group to clean dishes and refill water to a spring we had seen while walking. I volunteered to go, and three other friends joined. We got a couple of light torches too, just in case, and headed towards the fountain. Night came while we were on our way back to the shelter. We could hear the rest of the group singing and having fun in the distance. Suddenly one of my friends stopped and pointed at something just by the side of our trail. This wasn't here on our way down. I'm sure of it, he said. There was a light reflecting pole from the road, torn into pieces. We went from being happy and relaxed to being mildly scared in just a second and rushed all the way to where the rest of our friends were. We told them about our creepy finding right away. We were just kids, so fear escalated quite fast. Who could be hiding in the same mountain we were at, and why? Two of the older guys, and they were 14 years old, thought it would be a good idea to go and take a look around to try to calm us down. Although being without them was even scarier, we also appreciated it. They went away with a light torch, a knife, and a whistle, so we could hear from further apart if they were in trouble. 
we remained seated inside the shelter, which was nothing more than a couple of tarps held by sticks near a big boulder, silent and scared. I remember hearing quite a lot of sobbing around me. I was thinking I didn't want to die there. One of the girls suggested that we could sing to try and think of something else. Some disapproved because we might not hear the whistles, but we did anyway, although not very loud. We were like that for about 10 to 20 minutes. The whistle interrupted our song. We heard it clearly. Two whistles coming towards us at a really fast pace. I remember taking my knife from its sheath and keeping it in my hands. Luckily it was our friends. They arrived nervous and exhausted from the run. They said they stumbled upon a long standing stick with lots of blood all over it, more than what our nerves could stand. Most of us started crying, some prayed too. They told us they were going back to look for whatever was in the mountains with us and confront him. In case things go bad, we'll run somewhere else so we can't find you, one said. We asked them to stay, but nobody was able to move a finger to actually stop them from leaving. There was no more singing, only weeping and barely audible prayers. I just didn't want to die there. I wanted to see my family. After a while, we heard some noises, followed by the voices of our friends. They came back at a calm pace, with relief in their faces. It was all just a misunderstanding, one explained. It's just a park ranger. We found him and he explained to us that he was just walking around as part of his duty, said the other, and the bloody stick was just from a rabbit he had hunted for dinner. It was quite a relief and we relaxed. Someone even spoke about taking out our sleeping bags and going to sleep, and that sounded wonderful. But it wasn't long until one of the older guys said he was a bit suspicious. You see, he wasn't wearing a uniform, he said nor a badge or anything that could identify him as a ranger, answered another. And who walks kilometers away from the closest road, late at night, to hunt rabbits? Are there even rabbits in this altitude? Terror came back in a second. They were right. That story didn't make any sense. Let's go back there and freaking threaten him, one of the older guys said. We asked them to stay with us again and got the same results. Once they were gone, someone said that maybe he had followed them and now knew exactly where we were. We all shivered in panic. Nobody was paying the slightest attention to anyone else anymore. Nobody cried, and nobody prayed. I remember I only had one thought in my mind. I'd rather kill than get killed in this terrible place. We waited seated, silent, and ready to fight for our lives. We all had our knives out and ready. Minutes passed, and suddenly we heard people running and approaching. We heard screams of terror. From the sound, it was obvious there were more than two people coming at us. I hadn't been more scared in my life. I hope I could say goodbye to my mom, my dad, and my sister. My knife was ready to stab whoever came close to me. We finally saw our two friends running for their lives, being followed by two men. They came just at the front of the opening of the shelter and stopped. The two men chasing them did the same, and we could see their faces. They were our camp leaders, who had been following us all the time, but hiding and the four started laughing at us and asking if we were scared. It was just a joke, the entire time. Everyone started crying, and some even had trouble to grasp proper breaths due to anxiety for quite a while. We were all not amused. And only after a couple minutes, the funny four realized what they had done. They had taken 13 children to the point of holding a knife and being willing to kill with it. We obviously relaxed a lot, but our fears became anger. It had been a joke way out of proportion or the most basic of common sense. They spent quite a while saying how sorry they were, but we didn't care. We wanted them to leave us alone. But on the other hand, we were still too scared to sleep on our own, so we reluctantly accepted that they all came to sleep with us. It took them months to regain our trust again. It was the worst night of my life, no doubts. I've never had nightmares about it, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Now that I'm older, I always like to think of what would have happened if two guys had been there to kill us. We were children, sure, but armed and ready to defend ourselves if need be. I'm a journalist, so I can't help but think of some headlines. Two murderers stabbed to death in the mountains by 13 children. Things were a lot different back then. And the scouts has definitely changed for the better. When I was in my early 20s, I had a friend with a psychotic alcoholic father. She didn't live with him, 
He lived in a remote little coastal town. Now and again we would go together to visit him and stay the night. My relationship with him was creepy in itself, but that isn't the subject now. One night, when we were visiting, my friend and her dad had a drunken blow-up and kicked us out of the house. It was about midnight. We had gotten the lift down and didn't have a car. My friend's dad lived about four kilometers out of town, a huddle of two or three shops by way of a dirt road. We started walking down the dirt road to the town where there was a telephone booth. This was in the days before it was commonplace to have a mobile phone. I was going to call my folks who lived about an hour and a half away and see if they would come get us. The whole way to town, my friend was drunkenly moaning and crying about her broken relationship with her father, and she didn't let up by the time we got to the phone booth. We sat on a bench next to the phone while I woke my parents up. They agreed to come get us, and I sat down on the bench for the long wait. Shortly after this, a van appeared and parked just behind the bench we were sitting on, maybe five meters away. There were two young men in the front seats, and they were looking at us. If that didn't make me nervous enough, the van door slid open and I saw there were a number of young guys in the back. I don't remember how many, more than two. The place we were sitting was deserted. There were no houses nearby, just more road. No people, nowhere to run, no one driving by. It was a crappy little nowhere town. I stood up so I could see them better and kept my eyes fixed on the van full of men, acutely aware of our vulnerability. What I saw was that they were looking back at us. They were talking among themselves, quietly at first, then they started talking more and more loudly. It became evident that they were deliberately talking loud enough for us to hear. They were talking about pulling us into the van and taking us somewhere to have their way with us and kill us. I can't remember the exact words, but that was the gist of it. My whole body was not shaking, but quaking with terror. I couldn't take my eyes off the men. I remember the face of one of them so clearly, I could draw it now. He was just sitting in the door of the van, looking at me with no expression, looking at me with dead eyes, looking at me like I was a thing. At this time, my drunk friend hadn't stopped sobbing to herself. Whether she knew the van was there at all, I couldn't say. I knew I had to tell her about the danger, but I was actually so full of terror I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. That was when the most incredible thing happened. My friend's father, who has never apologized to anyone in his life, appeared, drunk, in his car. It's hard to describe how unlikely it was for him to do this. He could hold a grudge like no one you've ever met, and he was such a stubborn mule. He and my friend had an emotional reunion. The whole time my eyes were fixed on the van. The men had stopped talking and were just watching us. Let's go, I said. We got in the car and started heading for my friend's dad's house. The van started up and began to follow us. I tried to explain to my friend's dad about the men, but... He said, I'll just slow down and they can pass. They slowed to a crawl behind us, and then they began to shout out of the windows, screaming threats. They followed us all the way down the dirt road, and then all the way down the driveway of my friend's dad's house. They just sat in the van behind us, and we sat in the car waiting to see what would happen. All of my friend's dad's neighbors were holiday homes and nobody was in that night. We knew that if the group of men decided to get out of the van and carry out those threats, we would get no help. After a very long time, the van backed out of the driveway and they left. My parents came in a panic to the house when they couldn't find us at the shops. My friend's dad hid in shame and I went back to my family's house. I've been asked if I went to the police, but I can't remember. I don't think I did. It was a messed up time in my life, but that incident changed me forever. I'm a very fearful person now and very overprotective of my kids. And I don't want to change because I'd rather be like this than accidentally trust one of the millions of psychos out there. I used to live in a part of Memphis, Tennessee that was a little shaky. It was right on the edge of what some would call the ghetto but also there was a nearby area that was pretty secluded and desolate as it lived on the outskirts of the city, kind of near the industrial part near Raleigh for anyone unfamiliar. I was an eight-year-old boy when this happened, and my sister was five years older. The two of us went for walks on occasion. This time we went to the back of the housing division and further than we'd gone before. This area was pretty dirty and desolate for such a city, just train tracks and a nearby industrial facility. 
Lots of dry, tan grass coming through spots in the railroad gravel. Lots of dusty crap people dumped illegally around the tracks. There used to be a pack of stray dogs that frequented my neighborhood, but other than that, no people or cars would ever really be seen out there. Not that far behind my neighborhood, anyway. We were just walking along the tracks, talking, throwing rocks, when I saw some strange movement just beyond the tree line of the small wooded area about 40 feet ahead of my 11 o'clock position. I told my sister to look as we walked a bit closer. We made it to about 10 to 15 feet away from the wooded area when we realized the movement was in fact a mime of all things. In the middle of nowhere seemingly, hidden amongst the trees and thick dead vines that adorn the edge of the wooded area, painted face, black striped shirt with black pants. He had the exaggerated expressions of a mime too. His eyes got really wide and he seemed to start, I don't know, performing for us. He was kind of doing it in a way to, I guess, attract us, maybe entice us beyond the small wall of thick vines and brush and into the wooded area where he stood, or lurked to be more precise. I honestly couldn't tell you much about him as we ran away pretty quickly. I do however remember that it was a very hot day outside that day and his makeup was pretty dingy and gross as were his clothes. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable but I assure you it happened. I sometimes wonder who that mime was. I'm sure he wasn't there to kidnap children but who knows what would have happened if we'd gone to that thicket. And why there? He was just simply insane I think. His mind was gone which is far more creepy than any kidnapping stranger I've ever read about. This happened last year. School had just started and my only child was in kindergarten. She had only been in school a few days. We live in a rural area and we only have one car, so in the mornings, my daughter, her dad and I get up to take her dad to work. Then my daughter and I come home and get ready for school. Because we live in a rural, dead-end, dirt road, we have to drive about a half mile down the main road where her bus picks her up. Everything was fine that morning. I got her on the bus and headed home. I had the day off from work. I only work part-time, so days off in the middle of the week was normal for me. Anyway, I was doing some house cleaning and putting away some laundry. I went into my daughter's room and started hanging up some clothes in her closet. I had the TV on in the living room watching it from her room. Then I hear what sounds like a soft, muffled cough. I freeze. I have no idea what that was. I have no idea what to do. I'm just standing there almost paralyzed. My mind is racing. Maybe the cat is outside her window hacking up a hairball. Was I going crazy? Maybe it was the TV. It must have been the TV, right? Yeah, it's probably nothing. At this point I am standing in a room holding a shirt and hanger not moving a muscle. I really have no idea what to do. I then think I should head next door to have my father-in-law check it out. I say out loud, screw it. I drop the shirt and hanger and take off running to the house next door. Luckily my in-laws live in the house right next door only about a football field away and my father-in-law is on disability so he is almost always home. He is in his mid-sixties and on oxygen tank most of the time, so I don't really know what I thought he could do to help protect me, but I was just really freaked out and didn't want to be alone, and he was a hunter, and hunters have guns. So I am running faster than I have ever ran before across our yard, and I bust into his back door screaming his name. He comes walking out of the kitchen looking annoyed that I just scared the crap out of him. I am on the verge of tears trying to tell him something is going on in my house, but I also am talking so fast he can't figure out what I am saying. So he tried to calm me down and I tell him I think someone might be in the house. He asks if I'm sure and I say yes. I'm begging him to come over and just check it out and he agrees. He grabs his gun and we get in his truck and drive over to my house. I wait in the truck with the doors locked while he goes inside. I am freaking out looking all around me. He is in there for what seems like forever. He finally comes out and asks if I left a pack of Newports in her room right near her bed on the floor. Now, I am a smoker but I smoke camels. I have never bought Newports in my life. I tell him no, those aren't mine. His eyes get huge and he gets a really panicky look on his face. He tells me to stay in the truck and call the cops. 
He hands me his phone and I dial 911. The lady says we have to wait for the state troopers because we don't live in town. They seriously take like an hour to get out to us. I have already called my husband at work. He called his brothers to come and pick me up. He doesn't work far from home so it only took about 20 minutes for them to show up. My father-in-law, my husband and his brother are now walking all around in the woods that surround the houses. Nothing. There isn't anyone around besides us. After a while, the state trooper shows up and takes a look around, and he finds nothing as well. He takes the pack of cigarettes, I guess as evidence, and takes my statement along with my father-in-law's statement. He tells us there really isn't anything he can do. I can't tell him what the guy or girl looks like because I didn't see him. There is nothing. Just a sound I heard and some smokes on the floor. Nothing is missing from the house. There isn't anyone there now and it doesn't look like forced entry. Of course, there isn't going to be forced entry. We're in the middle of nowhere. Why would I bother to lock my doors when I leave to go somewhere? I feel like such an idiot, but nobody locks the doors around here. I don't even have a key for the door on my key ring. We just keep it on top of the outside fridge as a just in case. After the trooper leaves, my father-in-law gives my husband the gun to hold on to in case someone comes back. My husband and brother-in-law change all the locks and all the doors that day, and now we keep a key on our key rings and keep the doors locked at all times. We didn't take our daughter out of school that day. She was only five and we thought it would just stress her out. We did let the school know to be on the lookout for some weird activity, and we had talked with our daughter about stranger danger and what to do if she sees someone in the house she doesn't know. I did have her sleep in our bed for a few weeks, but she seemed like she wanted to go back to her room because she's not a baby anymore. But that's it. Life moved on, and nothing has happened since. We never heard from the trooper or anything like that. We never had another incident like that again either. I have no idea what they were planning on doing. I don't know if they were after me or my daughter, or if they just wanted to rob us. I don't think I'll ever know. I still get paranoid from time to time, and... I hate to be alone in the house. My husband got me a dog to keep me company and help protect us. I hope with time the fear will get less and less. Please always lock your doors no matter how safe you think your neighborhood is. You never know who might just be passing through. This happened to my father and my mother years before I or my older brother were born, but even for not being there, the story sends chills down my back. A few years after my father had graduated from CSU, my mother had graduated from TCU, and they both had jobs at a small company in Fort Worth, Texas. Having met a few company parties and hitting things off a few years later, they finally got married and my father got a job in Colorado for a small but growing engineer company. So off they go, packing up and moving from Fort Worth, Texas to Colorado. Getting in a car with their few belongings, they start to make their way to Colorado. Now I'm not sure why they took the road they did, but instead of a larger interstate highway, my father and mother decided to take a smaller, not so traveled one on a highway on their final stretch back to my father's hometown to catch Highway 14 to their new home. Having driven all day and it being the middle of the night, my father had the idea of pulling off to the side of the road to sleep for a few hours before waking up and finishing out the journey. There were no rest stops on this highway so it was either side of the road or nowhere to rest. My mother agreed but maybe 20 minutes after stopping and trying to get some sleep, my mother didn't feel comfortable and decided instead of sleeping here she would drive while my father rested and when he woke up she would rest a while while he took over. Just to reiterate this is a not so traveled highway. There are no lights and my parents are in the middle of nowhere and the nearest city or town is miles away. Not a mile or two down the road, my mother notices something on the side of the road and as she gets closer, notices a single man in the middle of nowhere with no lights or anything, just walking on the side of the road in the direction of where my parents were just parked. There was no car broken down farther up the road and there was nothing in miles to justify why this man would be walking on the side of the road. My parents don't bring it up much, but they have wondered what would have happened if they had both fallen asleep in their car that night with a man walking on a stretch of road that can kill you from thirst. Strangers out there are strange indeed.
To give you some context, this occurred roughly 14 years ago when I was 12 years old and living on the east side Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40-acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. It was also extremely handy because if you know anything about Australia, it's that we have tons of beasties that can very easily kill you. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town center. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say while we're at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain roughly three-fourths of the way up, so naturally most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks, and hideaways. We had trails that we could walk, and they led to a stream and a small waterfall, five to six meter drop. It was a truly beautiful place, but considerably scary to me and my smaller siblings, one brother and one sister slightly younger than me. We knew our neighbors on both sides of the property, but because the location of our house was pretty remote, our nearest neighbors were roughly a 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave to us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked for her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy crap when you're living in the middle of nowhere, but one in particular involved a guy I certainly don't want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors we didn't know were coming. When people we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man in a utility vehicle came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here. He immediately walked outside to see who this unwanted guest was. A little background about my dad, he is literally the most hardcore person you will ever meet. He has one leg after having an amputated earlier in his life after having an accident on a motorcycle while he was running from the police. He was in the Navy and was brought up in a very strict household. He had grown up in a very rough part of Sydney's West, so he had some pretty shady contacts too. In short, he is someone you really don't want to mess with. I wouldn't be surprised if he had killed someone in his life prior to having kids. Anyway, my dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about while my mom keeps us inside being protective. The man has a large red furred dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. It snarled at my dad but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog Millie, renowned beast killer just for the record, was snarling and going ballistic while being chained up in the house. Hey, my name is John. The way the man spoke was like a salesperson. A really slick and smooth guy who was on the outside seemed friendly but with the overtone of wanting something. So my dad immediately responded with, So what are you doing here, John? What do you want? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. Then they talked for a while and I could hear my dad talking with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. I did however hear my dad say, What are you thinking? Just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit her and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. So later that night the police showed up to take a statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around at our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body when he first arrived. P.S. The reason I know all of this is from asking my mother at the time and my father some years later. The police left without any more questions as it looked like she had died from natural causes. John was still at her house. I found him to be a very unsettling person. The way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night and I was trying to watch TV and he was playing songs on his guitar with my mom and dad at the table. I was angry because he was ruining my shows and I told mom I wanted him to go and that I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me that she felt the same and told me I should go to bed. The next day things seemed normal, went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way past her house. It felt strange 
and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before she passed. I was a bit sad on the walk home, until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's utility vehicle again parked out of the front of her house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog, Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone that I was going to miss. Again, that sense of our overfamiliarity made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't know this man and I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down to our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labeled him a weirdo and told my dad I was hoping he wouldn't come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mom and dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mom and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him he needed to leave, as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted that it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around, so why didn't this man? Or if he did know, why wouldn't he leave? After ushering him out, my mom and dad had a big talk in their room. My dad told us that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore and if we saw John again, to immediately tell him. The next day was a Saturday, so we were going to blow up our cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim as it was pretty warm out. Around 11 a.m., the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John is back. Just like the first time I ever laid eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with my mom, watching and listening through a screen door. John again with his weird over-familiar smile and dark eyes greets my dad and is met with, Look mate, I don't know who you think you are, but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and wife and I don't want you to come back. Do you understand? I didn't hear John's reply from his tone. It sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. Dad wasn't having it and told him to go or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, Dad said, Don't come back or you'll be sorry. This is where things truly get weird. As my dad lays this subtle threat on the man, his face completely changes to one of rage. He glares at us in the house, sticks up his finger and speeds out on the driveway shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back and told us we wouldn't be seeing John anymore and if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man made me feel uncomfortable in my home and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got from him when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was the Sunday or the Monday after that, but John did come back. He tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us not to like him. Before he even got out of the utility vehicle, my dad said, if you don't turn around and leave, I'm going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them of what happened. Apparently they were going to go talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happening with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed or possibly run over. I remember asking my dad what happened but... He wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me that he knew it was John after the way that last conversation ended. The next week after the mailbox incident, we went into town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat. And as we came down to the driveway, my dad immediately stopped my mom from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport where we parked our car, at the back of the house, there was a window that was open to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got increasingly more intense until we all noticed the window was missing. I remember being confused in the back seat, not really knowing what was going on, until I saw it. A man, dark eyes, over-familiar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage. He told my mom to rush down the driveway so we could mess this guy up. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into the thick lantana a really thorny shrub-like plant. My dad only being on one leg let Millie loose as she was going ballistic tied up to the house. She raced down the lantana engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with his flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. None of our possessions had been stolen or even moved. 
We must have caught this man just as he was entering our house. The police came the next day and searched for footprints with no avail. My father was furious and again alerted them to John and his strange behavior. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. The school we went to was pretty large considering where we were, but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within my first week at the school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher aides. I was caught completely unaware when that over-familiar dark-eyed man from the previous year was reintroduced as a teacher aide, except instead of John, he was introduced as Gregory. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of it all. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg something was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live close by? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else was he lying about? What if police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good 10 minutes trying to piece it together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. This is when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognized me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing. Just staring, I had just found out his dirty little secret. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I had found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked me if I was sure. I went to the school the next day and discovered the man had put in for indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learned of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know should John or Greg ever return. A year or two ago, my boyfriend, his cousin, and his cousin's friend decided to do a three to four day hike. We planned to do about 15 miles a day and camp out at night. We were so exhausted but not prepared for the heavy packs we would have to carry. So the first day goes okay. We're all exhausted and my boyfriend and I realize how out of shape we are as we struggle with the heavy packs. We wake up and my boyfriend's cousin tells us he could have sworn he saw flashlights and heard people walking around our campsite which made us nervous because we didn't see almost anyone as we hiked the first day. This has nothing to do with the story, but still something I find creepy. The second day, we start hiking again and we slowly make our way, realizing we will not be hiking as far as we would hope, when my boyfriend starts complaining about his foot. His toe is starting to turn black, I guess from the bruising of his boots while we walk downhill. Now, what we are trying to figure out is how we are going to make it to the nearest road to try to get back to the car. After what seems like forever trying to get back to the road using a map and having to cross a river like the mountain men and women we are, finally make it to a road. Now the problem is finding the way back to the car which is most likely miles from where we are when a pickup truck pulls over and asks if we need help. We say yes. We need to find a car and ask them which way is the road. They offer a ride and look at all of us individually. They then say, we'll take the girl with straight faces. Now, I'm not the best looking girl at the best of times and especially now I was extra gross from living in the forest for a day and a half. My group all say, no, no you're not. So my boyfriend and his cousin decide to go with them since there wasn't enough room for everyone. They open the truck store and out pour empty beer cans. We do not get a good feeling about this but they go anyway with their hatchets on their belts just in case. So now my friend and I are sitting on the side of the road when I say, what if they don't come back? To which my friend says he memorized their license plate just in case. He is a smart guy, that one. Eventually they come pick us up in our car, telling us how these guys were speeding down these narrow roads and being reckless. So thank God they made it back safe. The hike was a fail, but at least we're still alive, right? I just have no idea what would have happened if only I went with them in their car. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. 
If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio.